So I'm looking at this number of uh, views of, uh, of the recent uh, forum on uh, poetry and poetics uh, week four of uh, ModPo, uh, in which um, Al Phil Reese organizes uh, a, a, a group of uh, very uh, intelligent and, um, and uh, sensitive readers to look at you know, in these various weeks, examples of uh, poetry uh, that more or less could be defined as, you know, either experimental or avant-garde or uh, or uh, groundbreaking in, in various ways. And um, and uh, this, uh, this particular week, uh, the focus has been on uh, Gertrude Stein and, and a few others. And... Um, viewers and, and listeners and readers of my work will um, recognize in, in the position that I'm holding the uh, my cell phone uh, on this number that uh, numerical values and relationships uh, of sets of nu numerical values to other sets of numerical values or uh, or uh, or other sets of non-numerical values, uh, for example, sets of uh, words or or sets of images. Um, bringing those those sets together and establishing connections and relationship between those sets that are um, not entirely uh, constructed by uh, uh, us, me, uh, the one holding the. Uh, cell phone, um, but that exists in the world as a, a, a set, as, as something that was placed or organized or created by either another intelligent entity or uh, the, the, uh, the Dadaists and uh, some of the mid-century artists whose work grows out of figures like uh, Marcel Duchamp and uh, other Dadaists use the word uh, chance, you know, Cage used that word. Uh, uh, you know, Jackson McClough was, was, was fond of using chance operations to generate poetry and uh, poetic forms. Um, but uh, I, I don't use the word chance uh, because uh, I don't see uh, the constitution of the universe as being accidental. Uh, I see it as being uh, constituted by uh, uh, certainly um, too many forces to be able to entirely count or account for, but the, the dynamics of the relationship between those forces, just like gravity isn't arbitrary, right? It, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the constituent uh, elements of our known and living universe. So I wouldn't, you know, call um, gravity chance and I, I wouldn't call um, uh, what sometimes people refer to as coincidences of uh, syncretism in, in space-time, you know, I wouldn't call those, you know, arbitrary or, or, or random either. But in any case, this is the number of views um, that this particular uh, space-time coordinate uh, gives us today, and I, I, I could articulate it against a backdrop of another set of numerical values, or another set of images, or uh, or another set of words. But I prefer, in this instance, merely to take this number 491 and do a reading in some some ways, perhaps a close reading, but also a close history of uh, the number 491 and what it might refer to in relationship to uh, my positionality as, as a space-time uh, explorer. So, so the first thing, you know, that occurs to me is that um, I had recently posted uh, a comment on ModPo regarding, you know, readings of, uh, of Marcel Duchamp's new descending uh, staircase. And I had I had responded to a comment about uh, 
the way that um, it's possible to read this piece as um, you know non-binary gender challenge to certain conventions and um, you know Dar Marcel Duchamp is certainly really extremely problematic in so far as his construction of gender is concerned and there's there's a lot of violence there and it, it's 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 dangerous to uh, you know overly uh, heroicize his relationship to the gendered body because of that violence and I'm referring you know to images uh, there's one that and I can't remember the title but it's a uh, it's a it's a gives us a a view of, of, of a woman's body, uh, and it's it's a particularly uncomfortable view. It, in, 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 a, in a way, it's like a lot of his work, where it's a kind of gestalt you make you make of the scene. You know what 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 you might imagine. But for those of us who have had you know close experience of uh, the violation of women's bodies and and uh, in our lives and the the horror of uh, what uh, you know patriarchal violence represents you know upon our own bodies and the bodies of those that we love uh, it's difficult for you know us not to see this image as uh, you know either or either a rape or or as you know some kind of um, viol other kind of violation and in fact you know the display of the body is itself a kind of violation so anyway that's there in the duchamp but but i responded to it in a way that uh you know didn't allude to all of that that alluded in some ways to uh, the way that he uses imagery uh that is uh, a part of uh, the mechanics of early uh, motion machines and 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 uh, and motion images, uh, uh, the the photo guns and the the rotating you know uh, wheels and all of the all of those uh, optical illusion machines that preceded early cin cinema and also some of the imagery in early cinema itself and other forms of motion like the bicycle, which was you know. Um, uh, an invention, an invention of uh, the late nineteenth century, and became popular in the late nineteenth century, and you know, of course, you know, uh, into the twentieth century as well, and uh, the automobile and other things like that. And anyway, anyway, I had responded and uh, and talked about the construction of of gender, and had had tried to relate uh, this image of nude descending a staircase to. A, which was uh, part of the Armory show in uh, 1912, but that um, that grew out of perhaps a work that, that he created a year earlier, uh, which was titled uh, Sad Young Man in a Train, which also expressed motion in the same way. And I said that, you know, perhaps we could conceive of these two images as, as a kind of pairing, a gendered pair, or, or perhaps non-gendered pair because of the asymmetry of the figures, right? Well, one is explicitly nude and one is explicitly male, right? So one one calls attention to the fact that it's in the title it's named as nude. So we know that it's wearing no clothes. And one calls attention to the in the title that it's a young man. So we know it's gendered. But they look very much the same. I mean, what makes one nude and what makes one a man is is mostly the title, really, and even the location of the staircase. Well, yeah, one looks like it's walking down, but you could walk down from a platform on a train too, right? So, uh, so gender is really interesting, whether it's uh, non-binary in the way that we frame non-binary today or not. I would, you know, I would argue uh, that there's a distinction there in what the way that. Uh, we talk about non-binary gender and what what Duchamp was actually doing um, and then you have to look at the larger context and those instances of violence and his relationship to the Italian futurists really to get at that but anyway that was the the context of my contribution to uh, the reading of the nude okay so uh, why, why focus on this number 491? Well, in, in a way, because however the number 
comes to appear here, whether it's, you know, uh, by, you know, in quotation marks, chance, that chance that, you know, I don't particularly believe in, or whether it's by um, an intervention on the, the, the part of uh, whoever um, uh, has authority and, uh, and uh, skill and, um, and uh, technology to uh, manipulate uh, numerical values or or the patience of of of, of uh, the participants you know in in the production of this number and uh, you know once having if patience can mean a number of different things the patience to get to that number 491 or the patience you know and and uh, restraint you know not not to violate the number I, I may have violated it just now in clicking on <laughs> the uh, the 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 image here, but uh, hopefully it, it doesn't it doesn't uh, move up to to four ninety one once I'm I'm finished. But in any case, I happen to meet this number midway, right? Or you know, it met me, and I met it. It's like I often you know say about the way that I found. Uh, my res dog rescues. Well, one I found in the middle of a highway, and so she was waiting for me. And uh, and uh, one, you know, I, I received instructions for, and uh, you know, I had to go to him. And another, uh, I almost in, inexplicitly, seemed almost to fall from the sky, and I found in uh, in in a in my backyard, which was you know hurricane fenced at the time, and, and we got in there. I don't know, maybe it was like the frogs that we have in the desert, and uh, it was raining. And you know when 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 it rains in the desert, you know um, the frogs, which otherwise you know seem seem not to exist, suddenly exist. And the reason is because they're you know buried in the ground, and then. If it rains enough, the the soil becomes soft enough so that uh, and the frogs can respond and you know make their way you know to uh, to the surface. So perhaps a uh, little early one did did the same. But in any case, um, somehow uh, you know this was a chance meeting of uh, a contract in fee through theta and the number four ninety one on uh, on the. Uh, Modpo discussion board uh, webcast for week four, September 29th, uh, 2021. And, and the reason that I'm focusing on this number 491 is that's that, that this number belongs to, you know, pretty much exactly the way that, that I, I work and, and, uh, and, and create uh, systems of signification. And uh, it'll it'll be you know clear once once I start narrating uh, my particular relationship to this number four ninety one and uh, and uh, you know others relationship to this number four ninety one. All right. So first of all, in uh, in nineteen fifteen, uh, Alfred Stieg Stieglitz, who was um, uh, a pioneering you know modernist photographer uh, living in New York. Uh, uh, established a magazine called uh, uh, two two nine uh, yes uh, two ninety one, and uh, and the participants it only lasted for a little over a year, from nineteen fifteen to nineteen sixteen. But the participants included, uh, you know, uh, Apollinaire, the the great uh, cala calagrammatic uh, French poet. Uh, included uh, Francis Picabia. Um, the, the content was, you know, uh, there were uh, essays on exploring uh, dream material. I think Stieg Stieglitz wrote a piece on dream. Um, he didn't do much with the magazine, but uh, but published the magazine. Others, you know, seemed to dominate. And and one of those figures that dominated, you know, was Francis Picabia. The work was very much in line with uh, Duchamp, and Duchamp, you know, had a relationship to this uh, this uh, literary periodical, literary, literary and art journal, really, um, two two ninety one. You know, one of those historical avant garde magazines. You know, maybe maybe the most historical avant garde magazine. And then you know, Picabia, a few years later, I think I think it was nineteen seventeen, established a spinoff. Uh, 
magazine in uh, in Barcelona, so moved, you know, the location. Bar Barcelona was another, you know, uh, center of, of, of avant-garde activity. And, um, you know, even, even when I visited Barcelona in, uh, in the uh, 1990s, uh, there was still, you know, um, that, uh, uh, the trace of, of that history. They have a, a wonderful uh, Jean Miro museum. Uh, there's a uh, Salvador Dali museum, you know, and, uh, and and a lot of other stuff going on. Of course, there's a um, there's the whole uh, relationship to, to Gaudi. It's it's like you you, you can't imagine. Um, unless you visited Barcelona, the power of uh, Antonio Gaudi and his uh, amazing, um, what, there's not even a, really a word for them. Sometimes they're associated with surrealism, but his, his architectural designs are so much, uh, so unique and so uh, beyond that, you know, they incorporate you know, aspects of uh, you know, Gothic architecture with, uh, with, uh, sort of a, a bizarre reading, you know, done through surrealist eyes and, and this, uh, this, this, this almost aquatic, you know, undulating kind of, uh, uh, textures that some of the, the formations take on, give it like this un under, underwater landscape, like feel and, and, and it's all over Barcelona. So like, there's still like this, uh, great, like, creative, like, avant-garde imagination that runs through that particular uh, city. Anyway, um, so this number uh, that begins with, you know, 291 has, uh, uh, has a history of serialization, which also relates to my work, you know, uh, in, in a number of different ways. And then 491, obviously, would be the next extension of 391. I think there actually is a 491 magazine that, you know, would be based on uh, 391, the progression from 391 to the next unit of 100s. It, I also really like the way that when when Picabia decided to uh, to take up the, 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 uh, the number, you know, he didn't go from uh, 291 to 290. Two, he instead uh, progressed from the the hundreds, which is you know an interesting strategy. But Picabia was a weird and interesting artist, and you know for those interested, uh, a lot of that violence and that peculiarity that I discussed just just in this piece at the beginning, at the outset, in 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 Duchamp's relationship to the gendered body, is there in in Picabia, and even perhaps i don't i don't know i'm i'm tempted to say perhaps even more disturbing and violent ways but I, i'm not entirely sure that's true but they're certainly <laughs> disturbing and violent enough you know so uh, investigations can be made in that direction as well and there's one uh there, there's even a piece that appears in 291 because um i was curious to see what yeah, two ninety one's relationship to you know the the gendered body at the turn of the uh, you know towards the turn of the um, the century and at, at the outset of the twentieth century was and there's a description in the Wikipedia article about uh, if I can find it about a Picabia piece that does precisely what. I'm talking about. Oh yeah, here we go. Okay, so, um, so this wasn't you know uh, entirely. This is later. This is uh, August 1915. This is the uh, number five and six issue. Oh, here's here's another interesting reference, right? Like, like you see, say you see Stigli. <laughs> so uh, this, of course, is 
any this here you know here is and 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 this this say is hard not to associate with you know this is you know not a, a pipe right the work that comes the surrealist work that comes later but you know who knows maybe even aware of this particular uh, design and this particular caption ceci n'est pas un pipe Who knows? All right, so this is what I'm, I'm getting at. Uh, I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll focus on this image and then I'll, I'll read uh, uh, the description of, of a piece. Uh, portrait of a young girl, a, a young American girl in a state of nudity portrait d'une jeune fille américaine dans l'état de nudité, uh, which is relatively straightforward, drawn of a spark plug with the words forever on its side. Unlike the other pieces, there is no indication of whom the artist intended to portray in this piece, although at least one critic believes it is a portrait of Agnes Mayer and thus completes the team of drivers behind the magazine. Um, some critics have interpreted these images as filled with sexual and phallic imagery, yet others have seen in them symbols extracted from mechanical devices. Well, I mean, I don't see how that's a, I don't see how that's a dichotomy or a, I mean, they're clearly both, right? I mean, a spark plug is clearly a phallic symbol. Like, that, it doesn't even make sense any post-Freudian reading, even if you're not a Freudianist, uh, I don't think you can deny the phallic nature of that image, particularly if it's represented as a, as a human figure, right? Now, what's interesting is... Let's see... I knew more about this image. I, I confess to to being unfamiliar with the images themselves. And let me let me see if I click on it and make it larger. If it's clear, which is which? Oh, okay, yeah. So here we go. So here's this is the this is the young American girl in a state of nudity, and she's very phallic, right? I mean, how this is an image of a young girl versus a young boy is even even less certain certainly i think we can say unarguably even even less clear than duchamp's depiction of the sad young man in the train and and the nude descending a staircase now whether the nude is a nude male or a nude female is 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 our answer to that problem is only contextualized by the forces of, of the society at the time, right? You wouldn't have painted a nude man descending a staircase in 19, uh, in 1912. Uh, However, you would also, if you were a good Italian futurist, not have painted a, a nude woman descending a staircase in 1912 either. So... So Duchamp kind of confuses us because he already he violated the fascist uh, statute or whatever moratorium against the nude, right? That the uh, Italian futurists had had created and proposed. He violated like the, uh, the and 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 the the nude descending was you know was was referred to as obscene, right? By um, by those that are allowed to make those performative judgments in the you know in the art world and um so it, it, it it's, it's already enacting all of these violations so having being a participate in the in in violating these restrictions who's to say that that nude isn't male and that there was yet another violation of a, a gender norm so i i agree with that assessment um and um and what I'm finding here is references, I mean, this is just uh, me, but, you know, maybe references to lipstick, 
uh, as well, and maybe maybe that's why she's a young American. I don't know if if uh, you know Spaniards uh, and 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 uh, you know uh, that had spent a lot of time in 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 France and uh, and and Italians and and, uh, and and others, you know, uh, associated uh, American young women with 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 the um, the manufacturing of lipstick or or not it could very well have been because you know new york was the epicenter of uh advertising and 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 lipstick was one of the the modern you know products of uh identifying you know gender differences right so i mean that that i don't think that reading is totally bizarre but it also represents to me like it looks like you know going beyond that it's obviously a spark plug but it, it it also looks to me like certain kinds of modernist, you know, building constructions and architecture, very non gaudy right? So from, so uh, Picabia's, you know, uh, f future relationship to Barcelona, um, here is more like a, it, it looks like a, a, a tower from, from some uh, Martian, you know, architect or, or something, but, you know, vaguely reminiscent of either either the Chrysler building or the, the Empire State Building or others or some other extremely, you know, modernist, you know, imaginary building. The forever is uh, is really interesting because it references uh, this kind of advertising take on eternity, but like what's the eternity? Is it is it uh, is it the the power and uh, the uh, the energy and uh, and the reliability of the the, the spark plug <laughs> last forever, right? Like that's what we want of our machines, or or is it a promise of love? You know uh, that this young girl is making. You know her her beloved. You know whether that beloved is, you know, um, masculine or, or or feminine. We don't know. We only know you know who who she is we know that she's nude and then she's nude but what's interesting is if if she's truly nude then she wears her promise on her on her naked chest or or whatever part of her body that this centrality represents right because or maybe it could be you could imagine that as a tattoo but i i seriously doubt that even even in the quirky bizarreness of picabia's mind that he would have imagined a naked young girl with a tattoo that said forever running uh, lengthwise across her torso. So, so it offers all of these problems of interpretation and, 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 and this profound, uh, you know, like I had referenced Magritte earlier with the ceci, this is, but this is, this is not, this is, this is not, this is a, a spark plug. This is not a portrait of a young American girl in a state of nudity, right? So, uh, in a very profound way, uh, it plays with uh, the the difference between the title and and what we actually see, and and uh, and and does so in ways that like force this almost aggressive and violent uh, disjunction for us to to make sense of, and then he distributes he distributes. Uh, aspects of both domains of semantics into the next feature, right? So clearly, like, this figure is some kind of undergarment and really more clearly belongs to the semantics of, of nudity versus, you know, being clothed than, than this figure does. Uh, whatever the inscription forever means, whether it was initially there in the mechanical drawing or whether Picabia added it... Uh, uh, I'm not uh, certain, and I don't know if if art history knows either. But uh, but it does raise you know all kinds of problems of interpretation. And then if you move down to the other figure, we get some uh, Apollinaire like kind of uh, visual poetry. You know that references. Uh, you know the, this this kind of uh, conceptual borrowing from newspapers and 
and other found text and that but puts uh, these uh, these words in not exactly not exactly uh, calligrammatic organization but clearly calls attention to the visual layout of and relationship of these words to other images and so that reference over here to the uh, the way that uh, you know the Russian futurists as well as others you know we you know used words on the page and Apollinaire certainly uh, kind of makes us wonder about you know how this this uh, word is being used in 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 and in what ways you know it also participates in that domain of uh, visualizing textuality as well whereas you know say these markers down here clean seem to be you know clear-cut uh, examples of the way that an artist signs and dates a work right or inscribes um as a as a kind of caption a title to a piece and 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 so the the play with uh it it, it, it predates in a certain way right um work like uh, Andy Warhol, where the distinction between what an advertisement is and, and what a work of uh, art is, you know, you can get confused because no one would use this for an advertisement, but it's not particularly advertising itself as high art, right? All of the, uh, all of the moves and, and motions, you know, uh, create these Spaces of play, you know, sometimes uh, ambiguity and sometimes um, almost a, a, a playful back and forth communicative exchange between design, modernist design as, uh, you know, uh, uh, graphic uh, commercial design and uh, and the high art, you know, of, you know, say this one particularly reminds me of, uh, you know, Russian futurism. All right, so uh, let me go back to uh, to L. Phil Reese's page and back to our number four ninety one. Well, four ninety one is is also interesting to me because my very first literary publication. <laughs> well, no, that's not true. I actually had work really, really bad, uh, immature. Uh, high school work but you know before before I had really you know you know found uh, a kind of way of working published in, in, in a few magazines I had uh, uh, a couple of pieces published in, in, in a journal the high school journal whose name I can't remember uh, and I had um, uh, I think two pieces published in a in a high school newspaper, and then uh, a few friends of mine and myself created a magazine called uh, "This Is the Siberian Husky," and I published um, uh, um, quite a lot of that work uh, uh, under different pseudonyms. So, um, you know, my friends all had pieces in 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 the work. And then uh, I had a number of of different styles that I I enlisted and under different names, and um, and and sort of filled out the work. So I, I was like you know I was like the guy that uh, you, you know I, I I was all the pieces from the cutting room floor that filled out the album with all the, so that it really made a magazine because I think if. If I if I hadn't done that, then we would have had such a, a, a slim magazine that we you know wouldn't have even had you know this is the Siberian Husky. We it would have had to have been this is not the Siberian Husky. You know, so you see that that word was there even even then that in that high school magazine the word was there. Um, this is right, and then later became this is this is not, and a, and a number of different procedures that I've worked with over you know ceci n'est pas and, but but even there and 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 the, the the funny thing about that magazine was that you know it the the ceci you know which was never a ceci in that instance in but was really a siberian husky because i had a 
Siberian Husky, and I had a book about S Siberian Huskies called, you know, this is the Siberian Husky. It was a rather large volume addressing, you know, the behavior and, uh, and the particular needs of Siberian Huskies, who, you know, if you're familiar with Siberian Huskies, are very spirited creatures that require an, an abundance of exercise uh, because they're basically bred to carry uh, a lot of heavy weight in, in Arctic <laughs> conditions. And uh, if they don't do that, you know, then they're not happy. So, and they're very, you know, territorial and, and hierarchical. In, in their organization because they're basically, you know, the wolf version of, of dog. And um, anyway, that was the, the initial high school magazine. I had published material in that. But the, the, first, the first, you know, real publication of mine, you know, occurred in um, when I was at UCSD, the University of California at San Diego. And um, there was a, there was a, a, a like a centralized literary magazine called the Birdcage Review. And um, I had attempted to have a relationship with the Birdcage Review, but the constraints of their editing at that at that time, I, I, I wasn't very participatory with uh, uh, certain kinds of uh, editing of my work. And uh, they wanted to, you know, excise certain things and extract certain things. And I didn't want them to do that, so my relationship with that magazine was limited and never, I had work that was, I created a, a, a series of uh, poems on, on these little circles that uh, were, were like cut up poems um, uh, that, uh, that had these layers and you could take these circles and you could peel off uh, strips of words and reveal other words and then um, and then whatever you did with these strips you know after you peel them off of these little discs you could stack these discs or you could you know put them in relationships to one another or anyway so um, I had stripped off some of these uh, texts on, on these discs and then uh, some of the text you know I had written and some of the text I had found, and I there were all kinds of different relationships to, to texts and history, as as my work usually has. And then, so I had stripped off some of this, and then as 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 I stripped them off, you know, I had recorded uh, the order of their stripping, you know, almost like Duchamp, but instead of stripping the um, the bride bear, you know, I had stripped these little you know wheels wheels of of, of found poetry bear. And, and then I had, you know, transcribed uh, the, the words of, of, of this text uh, in a more conventional form, you know, as, as, as they had peeled off of, of the discs. And uh, I, I hadn't, you know, destroyed all of the discs in the process. Some of them remained, but uh, I had produced these poems in real, using that process. So um, it was sort of like, it began as a kind of like Kurt Spitters or, or Tristan Zara or, or any of those other uh, Dadas who, who, you know, uh, cut up a magazine and then glue onto a page. But then it like it inverted the process and, and, and extracted again. So I had initially like um, cut up the words and then I had pasted them onto a material. And then I had organized the discs in certain ways. And then uh, selections of... Uh, ways in which the the work would be uh, deconstructed were organized, and then the deconstruction of the work itself was documented in these final poems that presented themselves as more or less like conventional poems, right? And uh, I thought that was very amusing. But um, but anyway, the I can't remember his name, but you know he I had I had uh, taken a few classes and. He, he was uh, in one of them. I remember he was in one of the classes I took under David Anton. Uh, and I can't remember his name, but, you know, he was editing this uh, Birdcage Review at the time, and, and he, he thought that he didn't like, you know, the way that some of these images came together. And and the, I didn't really, be, I wasn't too explicit about it, but 
I thought it was funny to, it was like, you know, like, it was kind of like not liking the way a tree fell in, in, if you live in the forest, you know, and you walk in nature or whatever, and it's like, well, we, we think that, you know, your landscape is very beautiful, but we don't like where that particular tree is. And so we would like you to remove it before, you, you know, you present your photograph of this scene. And I was like, well, no, you know, that's the way that they came out and I'm, you know, I'm not going to edit it. Right. So uh later I, I i i just i i i got later that you know editors you know very seldom get the work and and that you just you know you sort of go along with them and pretend you know whatever like like you do when you do anything like like you do when you're you know being arrested by the police you know you you give them limited information and 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 you let them believe whatever they want you know <laughs> it's just a lot safer for you so uh in this at this moment which was probably gosh i can't remember but you know around uh around 86 or something 1986 um you know the the work got rejected by the birdcage review which like i said was like the the central sort of consol central consolidated uh literary magazine for uh UCSD so a year or a couple of years later, or or three years later, I can't really honestly remember, then there was uh, a more student, you know, uh, uh, they weren't really outsiders, but, but, but you know, um, independent, like that's, that's the word that we would use today. There was a more independent magazine that was formulated, and um, I can't remember which way the parenthesis went if it was open parenthesis or it was closed parenthesis but it was either called open parenthesis 91 or closed parenthesis 91 so um you know to give you an idea if you don't know what i'm talking about uh, i'll just go ahead and and let's see i'll make this quite a bit bigger All right, so it was either uh, it was either this I don't think so though, or it was oops or it was this, and i'm I'm thinking it was this but what it, whatever it was uh and and i again i never asked uh, the editor uh i think the main editor there was a a young poet named craig folts and then there was another poet uh that went by the name b litman and then there was another poet, and uh, I had actually had a longer lasting relationship with this other poet, but I some for some reason can't remember his name, uh, who was, uh, Craig, Craig was more interested in narrative, and he was kind of uh, rewriting out of these narrative, you know, styles, like, like the way that, you know, and uh, I can't remember what poet that he was writing out, but he was, he was writing out like this imaginary life, like the, like the way that you would write out like the 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 mythic life of Billy the Kid or whatever. But you know, it was of you know some like New York poet or something. So he had this kind of narrative interest, and uh, and it was kind of, kind of like you know walk you know it felt like it had this you know feel like a space between you know New York school and. And you know, sort of the, the the comic end of some of the beats, or like maybe like like slightly Jack Spicerish or something. And then uh, the B. Litman's work, you know, felt like it, it fell pretty squarely within what was going on with the kind of like prose style end of of uh, language poetry at the time. And then uh, and then I oh, I really wish I could remember the name of the other poet. Uh, the young man and and his work was um was very graphic and and visual and he would do these um he had these like word lists that he and the word lists were interesting like because they at first looked like they were just taken from 
the dictionary, but then if you looked at them closely, they would have these like micro variations in, in, and, and like interesting, you know, um, kind of surprises. But then he would, he would take them and he would Xerox them and he would do what now I call like, uh, what I, I, I refer to as theta, but like this disintegration of, 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 uh, of copy. So as you, as you, you go along in these, uh, serial reproductions of, of these images, you know, the, the, the image quality degrades and you get like, um, uh, all these interesting things going on with the grain and the texture of the apparatus itself. You know, in this case, the, his, his interest was in the apparatus of, uh, you know, we had copy machines back at that time, you know, Xerox machines. That's how you made images of, uh, of, of parts of, of text. If you went to the library, you, you know, you, you stuck your book in a copy machine. We don't really do that so much anymore. I mean, I'm sure that we still have copy machines, but now it's so easy to make representations with one cell phone. I don't know why anyone would pay, uh, you know, 10 cents unless you had to, uh, reproduce them. This was like around the same time that I don't know if, you know, this, this particular, uh, company exists anymore, but Kinko's was like, a, you could make uh, course packs and stuff and you could take them, you know, your text and they would make, you know, Xerox copies. And, 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 and so like, it, it was very much like he was playing with, uh, you know, aspects of the way that the university ran, right? Like the technology, but also like the economy and Kinko's. And there was even like a Kinko's distributor within UCSD. So it kind of like set inside our set and his work was very interesting. And I really wish I could remember his name, but I can't. And I don't know why. Maybe, maybe my, maybe my unconscious or subconscious is somehow protecting him from something. <laughs> anyway, uh, it was all, you know, pretty interesting work. So I had done this piece that like began with letters that a friend of mine had sent from, uh, his, um, trips to China. And, uh, and I had taken, you know, his letters without his permission, by the way, and I had taken his letters and I had um, thoroughly rewritten them and I had, you know, reorganized them and I had taken out um, anything that didn't refer to China or didn't have like a, 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 a kind of... Uh, a certain kind of feel, you know, that I, I wanted to get. And I was, you know, thinking about all of those imagists and post images that, you know, used like these exoticized images or this, this, uh, this othered, right. Poetics. Like, so for example, for Picasso, it was African art, right. That was this colonialist other that, you know, like he, he appropriated and became like his high modernism. And for a lot of the images, it was, it was China or it was Japan or it was, you know, something else, but it was clearly like this, like finding something other than, than, uh, European, you know, the European tradition and in finding it, you know, um, you know, and, and part of that discovery one could say is, you know, good because it opens us to different, aesthetics in the world and it broadens our purview, but part of it was clearly, you know, uh, part of this colonialist project, right? And so I was interested in both of those things. I was interested in both like, you know, you know, exploring it as a materiality uh, and, and, and uh, exploring its uh, uh, hidden colonial um, embeddings, right? And, and participation in in, 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 in other types of ideologies that, you know, at that time, maybe not so much anymore, but at that time, we're still really like, um, not part of the discourse on, on imagism and, uh, not part of the discourse on, uh, they, they had already become part of the discourse on, you know, Picasso's borrowings and, um, the surrealist borrowing, but, but not so much, you know, in terms of like figures like, like Pound or, or, or even later, you know, uh, Kenneth Rex Ross, who, you know, certainly wasn't a fascist, but certainly who was a colonialist, whether, you know, we want to admit and recognize that or not, you know, but I, I did. And, and, and I still like Rex Ross. I never liked Pound really, but, um, 
Well, actually, that, that's not entirely true. I liked, I liked, I, I thought it, I didn't think it was particularly accurate, but there was a slim uh, collection of, of pounds, you know, either real or pretend uh, translations of ancient Egyptian poetry. And, and they were kind of like wonderfully like, um, not Egyptian, you know, they, they, they participated in this like, kind of like, um, uh, romantic reading of what, you know, Egyptian poetry might look like if it were translated by, um, a really, you know, bad version of, uh, of, of, of Shelley as, as performing, you know, um, a kind of rendering of, the Song of Songs or something like that, and and uh, and I, I kind of li liked it, but but other than that, you know, I mean, I, I knew I knew a lot of people and had friends that liked uh, the Cantos, and I never got into it, never really got into T. S. Eliot. It always seems dodgy and and unboring to me, but but in any case, uh, you know, I, I did like I did like uh, Kenneth Rex Roth and and uh, you know some of uh, you know the um, the relationships that he had to these uh, you know non-European poetries I thought were interesting and, and problematic and that was you know one of the the reasons why I wanted to create this piece so it began as you know the this this uh, this rewriting of these letters and then uh, you know I would use you know stuff from the the Tao Te Ching and I would use you know stuff from you know you know uh, various you know uh, either you know Chinese or or or, or Japanese Buddhist texts, and I, and I and I tried to give it you know um, and and other kinds of uh, you know literary references to to um, to the East in 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 the East in the sense of uh, that particular uh, domain in 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 the Pacific, you know um, uh, the the coastal region of uh, J Japan and China and but also um, yeah, the in interior the Chinese interior so you know one could imagine that if one were voyaging in this you know and, and, and I, I may or may not have read um, uh, Italo Calvino's uh, invisible cities at that time but I was certainly thinking about it that way as a kind of like uh, uh, in, uh, in investigation of uh, this kind of um, orientalizing, you know, uh, poetics and uh, and exploring it and seeing if I could, um, you know, reveal some of the uh, the features, you know, of that uh, poetics uh, in this in this particular piece, and okay, so I had that work, and and I offered it to uh, to this magazine, right? Close Princess ninety one or Open Princess ninety one or whatever it was, and they uh, they accepted it. So that was that was my first uh, real real, you know, outside of my own, you know, self publication. That was my my first real publication, and uh, and and they spelled my name right. <laughs> it's actually the best. It, it's the best publication of my work that that has ever been done. And uh, all right, so that 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 happened, and like I said, sometime in the the eighties. No, I do not need to save that. All right, and then. Uh, so I still have, although I think it's been written, rewritten several times in several different contexts, but I still have, oddly enough, because I've lost so much over the years, I would say that um, of all of the literary work that I've created, um, maybe, maybe, and, and this is really stretching it, but maybe 10% of everything I've written, you know, still exists, at least, you know, exists uh, in my files, someone else may have a file of other work that I've done, but um, remember, we're still talking about this number 491 and, and how um, it's extremely evocative for me, both 
you know, in terms of art history, but in terms of my own personal history. Let me see if I can find this. So here's, here's a, yeah, this is the, this is the version of it. Uh, let me see if I can make this bigger. Hold on, I'll just go ahead and have it read itself. We'll have Aaron read it. He doesn't seem to want to read it. No, I, I, I can't get Aaron to read the, the text, so we won't do that. Um, and it's very difficult to read in this format. I should be able to get this bigger. Oh, here we go. I don't know why Aaron doesn't want to read it, but. So by the time it got to this stage, uh, I'm not even sure uh, my friend who had written me the letters would have recognized you know, his own writing in it. But this was very much the way that a labyrinth of, of visions worked as well. By the time I was finished uh, polishing and constructing uh, the relationship between the the uh, the lines and, and, and the sentences, uh, uh, I, I, I doubt that anyone would have recognized a lot of the sources in, in the material. And that was, you know, the case in a labyrinth of visions for most of the text, although sometimes I would allow the uh, the references to, to seep through in you know the the transparency into uh, the opacity, meaning that uh, or, or I may I may have said said that backwards, but sometimes I would allow a line from say Whitman or or Emily Dickinson or Blake to, you know to become very obvious. In this case, I don't remember having. Uh, done that with with the work so this isn't exactly what appeared in close parenthesis 91 but uh it's it's a it's an iteration it's one of the iterations of uh of the work that that appeared in uh in the journal 191 Oh, that's interesting. So I've, I've talked about how uh, the celebration of uh, the Divine Mother is approaching on October 7th and, uh, and uh, that um, we are preparing to celebrate the, the nine you know, forms of 
called Ma Durga, and and then uh, it interests me that this this comes here now. Now, uh, although the letters were written from from China, you know, I had allowed myself in in this sort of elaboration of of its you know Orientalization, you know, to to find itself wherever it might find itself, and uh, you know, I, I suppose it, it found itself uh, here. I, I like I like the line. I still like the line. Um, Kali, mother of darkness, tell us of the smooth and the striated. Okay, so if if you don't get that reference, that's that's actually a reference that comes from uh, the Lizen Guattari, and so you can look that up. The smooth and the striated in uh, the Lizen Guattari. Um, but anyway, uh, it relates, you know, to ideas, you know, not only of uh, forms of, of art making, but of forms of, of space, right? And, uh, and of kinds of space, space, you know, that can be occupied in different ways. And of course, our space is, is always already occupied by so much. And, um, and, and that's, that's there uh, in, in this line. Uh, Kali uh, and, and Mother of Darkness refers, you know, to uh, the the etymological uh, origins of of Kali's name, you know, which which uh, refers to uh, the 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 darkness of of night and uh, and the space of uh, uh, a fullness, emptiness, you know, I I, I suppose uh, uh, the uh, the long uh, night of 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 her existence, which which relates, you know, night in this sense and and darkness to to origin and this this almost this time before time because uh, Kali's you know name also relates to uh, uh, etymologically to to uh, Sanskrit word for for time as as well, right? And so uh, she, in some sense, you know, precedes time and. Exists at its fringe and in this uh, space that also uh, you know reminds us of, of uh, you know both the limits of our of our own space and 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 of a, a time you know before our ability to conceptualize it as 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 something that we exist in right. Um, Kali, mother of darkness, tell us of the smooth and the striated, but if you know not at all of these things, provide us at least with the peace of compassion for that which transgresses our empathy, our comprehension, and our reason. Um, I still I still like that. And then you can see the some of the other imagery. So that's um, fierceness of lion. So um, Leo's name, little early one, you know, is 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 a reference to the lion, and 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 Fiber's name is a reference to the the rabbit. Lupe is no longer with us, but her name obviously references the wolf. But you know, perhaps. Perhaps there's a bit of fox in her as well.